Hello and welcome to another episode of the 2023 Architecture Foundation Book Week. Um, today we are joined by Manuel Hertz, who is discussing the book Africa Modernism, the Architecture of Independence. And I'll pass over to Manuel now, who will speak a little bit more about himself and the book. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, maybe before I start with the, with the presentation, uh, a few words on the work that we're doing in my office and uh, in, in academia to kind of contextualize this. Uh, I have an architectural office uh, based in, in Switzerland, in Basel, and, and we do work uh, quite, uh, let's say, uh, worldwide, uh, working on the African continent, Asia, Europe, uh, the Americas. And uh, a lot of the work that we do tries to, uh, let's say, challenge or, or investigate this relationship between client, political power, uh, the role of architecture, and and uh, kind of, let's say, questions of agency. And, and uh, that uh, led me also to this investigation of <clears throat> what role took architecture or what role did architecture have during uh, that uh, quite amazing uh, um, period of, of political transformation uh, that <clears throat> the African continent underwent in the in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, uh, this kind of period of decolonization. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a practicing architect, but also, let's say, a scholar researcher, uh, but I do see both of these dimensions very much entwined and, and interwoven in my work. Um, maybe uh, with not much further words of introduction, I'll, I'll start. Uh, um, So I'll I'll like to um, guide you through this this book um, African Modernism um, that uh, me and a team of researchers scholars architects put together a couple of years ago <clears throat> and it deals with the period of history on the African continent that is marked by incredible kind of optimism uh, it was and this image is maybe a kind of indicative of this joy this optimism that marked the continent in the late 1950s, early 1960s, where uh, over a period of just a few years, um, five, six years, uh, more or less half of the countries of the African continent gained independence. Um, uh, this is the a map of uh, marking in, in orange or red uh, countries that became independent in between 1957 and 64. <clears throat> Uh, and it shows how uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, how revolutionary and how how um, all encompassing in a way this this political transformation was. It also maybe for us uh, interestingly shows a certain kind of geographic continuity, and uh, I would claim also a certain kind of climatic uh, uh, kind of continuity. These are. Uh, to a largest extent, uh, countries of the tropics. Um, uh, and this might also, and we can discuss this later, have an impact on, on the architecture. Um, but uh, let's go back to, to the, the, this optimistic spirit. <clears throat> um, it was underlined by a spirit of African unity, of collaboration uh, amongst the African countries, uh, and, a, and a certain kind of... Um, confidence of the young African nations trying to mark their place in the new world order of the mid uh, 20th century. Um, and the book that we've put together asks the question, it's a very simple question, what did what role did architecture play in this context? So first of all, uh, I'll start with a series of images that try to show that the architecture that uh, was was produced during this time is of an incredible quality is of experimental joy is is uh, kind of trying to experiment with new materials with new forms with uh, 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 has this um, uh, kind of uh, exploration of a new 
formal language. Uh, uh, here, as an example, the Foire Internationale de Dakar, the International Trade Fair of Dakar in Senegal, uh, that is maybe one of the absolute masterpieces uh, of its time, not only in Senegal, not only of the Afri on the African continent, but I would claim worldwide. Um, what we did uh, uh, was to look at five countries more closely, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Kenya, and Zambia. Um, we chose these countries for various reasons, but any choice has something arbitrary to it. So um, these are five countries that span the African continent from west to east, um, that go from just below the Sahara to just uh, above the southern tip of, of the African continent, and that are both former French and, and British colonial countries or, or colonies. Uh, but as I said, we could have chosen so many other countries and and uh, to a certain extent, uh, this choice is also uh, yeah, arbitrary or, or, or um, uh, uh, due to, let's say, personal preferences. Um, we put together, uh, and I'll show you the book in more detail later, um, this, this quite thick uh, book, African Modernism, uh, Architecture of Independence, um, published uh, by Park Books in, in Zurich, um, that, that uh, represents um, a documentation uh, and, uh, let's say, recording uh, of the architectural production of that era. Um, and um, uh, here may be a glimpse uh, of a few sample pages, uh, but uh, as I said, I'll go more into the structure of the book at the later part of the, this presentation. Um, it also went hand in hand um, or goes hand in hand with a parallel exhibition um, where this kind of, where we unfold the archive, let's, let's put it like that, uh, where we unfold the archive that we've put together um uh that was first shown at the vitra design museum uh, just outside of basel uh, and i was then traveling um across europe across the african continent uh, and and across uh, the us um, um but um <clears throat> what is so particular about this period, about the architectural production of this era, and and how did we approach it? I, I want to um, try to answer some of these questions by looking at buildings uh, more specifically, uh, by looking at some of the specific buildings more uh, more in more detail. Um, the first maybe term that I want to question uh, is the term of independence itself. Uh, uh, now, for us, it seems so such an obvious. It seems to have such an obvious meaning. Either you're uh, a country that has independent, that is an independent nation, or that is not independent, that is therefore dependent on some kind of colonial power. But um, uh, uh, and 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 the term is is often celebrated, such as this uh, Hotel Independence again in Dakar by a French architect called Henri Chomet uh, that was built on the central square of, of Dakar um, and was meant to, to house, let's say, uh, global visitors, tourism, business visitors, bringing them to, to Dakar. Um, but we can see the, let's say, the complication of, or the complexity of this term of independence immediately when we look at another building built by the same architect a few years previously uh, in Abidjan, the major city of the um, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast. So here we have the Hotel de Ville, so the town hall um, of Abidjan, um, built in the very center of Abidjan. And when we look at the date that it was uh, designed and built, it is 1957, uh, 1956, which in fact is prior to independence. Uh, Ivory Coast uh, became independent in the early 60s. So we could claim that this in fact is a, is a colonial building, is a building representing colonial administration, colonial power. Um, uh, and then, but 
uh, why do we show it in the book? Why do we feature it in the book? Uh, because it was, in fact, on the footsteps of this building that the first president of the Ivory Coast, Felix Houphouët Bonghi, declared independence of the very nation. Um, it was exactly here in the courtyard that the that independence of the Ivory Coast was declared. So ever since then, this building also, to a certain extent, symbolizes independence and symbolizes uh, this kind of uh, new political status of the Ivory Coast. And and we see uh, immediately a, a kind of a blurring of the lines, a blurring of the actors. Uh, Henri Chomet, an architect who worked for the colonial power, but also became very, very important and a very important architect during the the, uh, the years after uh, decolonization. We see buildings, if we can call buildings actors, uh, slipping from colonial. Uh, from a colonial institution into uh, an institution of of uh, maybe decolonization, um, and we can see these kind of slippages of symbolism, slippages of of values, and this I find interesting. This kind of blurring of the lines. Then um, maybe the term of let's say modernism, um, of futurism, uh, uh, we see uh, maybe very well represented in buildings like this, uh, the La Pyramide um, uh, shopping mall that was built a few years after after independence in the very center again of, of Abidjan. Uh, and it, I think um, more than many other buildings, it represents this kind of optimism, this ex joy of exploring new forms. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, it goes, uh, together with many other buildings uh, in in Abidjan, such as this Alpha 2000 uh, uh, bank building, again, Henri Chomet. Um, uh, and if someone calls this building Alpha 2000, there's almost like a competition of, of who can be more in the future. Postel uh, 2001, it's the skyscraper on the right, uh, slightly pinkish skyscraper. So. If someone is in the 2000s and someone want, the next person wants to be in 2001, it's, it's like, who can be further ahead in the future? So there's this kind of maybe trust or, or, or uh, hopefulness of being part and shaping this future. Um, on the other hand, it was maybe exactly along the lines of what we call modernism that... Um, the colonial power structures really were founded upon. Uh, uh, so there's this deep amb ambiguity and and uh, skepticism that we need to uh, approach. Maybe also this architecture with and and uh, uh, and the terminology of of modernism uh, as a whole. Uh, and and we cannot resolve this skepticism say it's either good or bad or it's it's on this side or on that side but it's just a, let's say a, 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 an added dimension uh, with which we need to observe these these buildings um, um, the buildings came with the rich history and and anecdotes uh, I like this building very much uh, it's a beautiful constellation of program and functions as I've hardly ever seen it before. Uh, it stands in the it's the so-called Chai House. It stands in the center uh, of Nairobi, um, capital of Kenya, and it combines three beautiful functions. The building in the backdrop drop is the, let's say, um, uh, interest group of the tea growers of tea farmers of, of Kenya. The um, UFO in the foreground is a discotheque, um, and below it is a petrol station. Uh, so uh, a beautiful also constellations of programs, functions that also dwell, let's say, on, on values of modernity, technology, uh, and, and uh, advancements uh, on, of, of, this, of this nation. Um, 
In terms of program, what was built, uh, we can see a very wide range of programs. We have academia, we have universities that are being built uh, here in, in Ghana, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology uh, that brought uh, high-level international education uh, into the center of, of uh, Ghana, built by various uh, architects, uh, such as uh, Max Gerlach, uh, I believe a Danish uh, architect, um, uh, but also um, uh, local architects, Ghanaian architects, in this case, uh, John Addo, uh, who built a, a student housing, a student hostel. Um, so the, this question of where did the architects come from, of course, becomes incredibly crucial. Are they from the former colonial powers, France and, and Great Britain? Uh, are they local? Um, why are there so few local architects? The answer to that is relatively easy because there was hardly any kind of uh, center of architectural education in sub-Saharan Africa, apart from uh, apartheid South Africa, which was off access uh, to, to the local population. So uh, there was hardly a possibility for uh, Ghanaians, Kenyans, uh, or, or Senegalese to, to study architecture. But... Um, uh, the, there were a few exceptions. Uh, uh, in this case, John Addo, uh, uh, who who was able to um, become an architect and and build locally and did some amazing work there, uh, really fantastic work. Um, and we have uh, we do indeed have uh, a lot of architectural production coming from architects of the former colonial powers, France and, and Great Britain. Amongst them, maybe some of the best examples are of um, Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, um, who built a, a lot of uh, fantastic work in Ghana, in in uh, Nigeria, uh, and and across other countries in in Western Africa. Um, uh, again, educational um, uh, projects, <clears throat> uh, or um, this architect Henri Chomet, uh, who whom you've seen before, um, and there again we see a certain kind of slippage. Um, this is not the stereotypical, let's say, foreign architect who jumps on a plane and uh, designs something from his office in 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 France and and then executes it. Uh, in Senegal or in, in um, the Ivory Coast, uh, but he really is committed very much uh, to Western Africa, and he in fact spends his whole professional life uh, in Western Africa. Uh, his whole career is based on executing buildings uh, in, in these countries, and, and he basically lives there, becomes, I don't know uh, if it's too, too much to say, a, a, a local architect, uh, but is thoroughly embedded in a local culture, often also collaborating with local artists, with local artisans, local designers, and local planners. Um, uh, this is one beautiful example here in Dakar uh, to, to uh, execute and design these, these buildings. Um, in a similar way, we have um, uh, other architects who come from the so-called Western world, but maybe more surprising countries, uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, for example, here, Karl Nostvik, um, uh, who, who uh, uh, is a Scandinavian architect and, and uh, in the early 1960s decided to move to Kenya uh, and also, again, spend his whole professional life uh, in in Kenya, in Nairobi, uh, and building his whole career uh, in the country and executing a masterpiece. Also in collaboration, of course, with Kenyan architects, uh, this Kenyatta International Conference Center. Um, that uh, is maybe, again, one of the best uh, um, buildings on the African continent and is on eye level with any kind of architectural production that took place globally during this era. Um, so we see this, this, this kind of question of, of where do the architects come from? Um, first of all, gaining quite a large scope, uh, countries that maybe 
we didn't expect so much. Um, but again, there is, of course, a political dimension to it. Uh, and just to, to say a few words on that, uh, we see this. Uh, we are here now in, in Zambia, in Lusaka, the capital of, of Zambia. Uh, and we see this uh, um, high-rise building, Findeco House, designed by, by um, Yugoslavian architects. Uh, why Yugoslavian architects? Um, it was, in fact, Zambia um, that uh, took a, a very strong role in the formation of the so-called uh, non-aligned movement, uh, a group of countries that, uh, um, uh, that included uh, Zambia, Ghana, Yugoslavia, um, India, amongst others, that tried to, let's say, occupy a force field independent of the so-called Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc uh, that try to be non-aligned to these two blocks uh, and try to, uh, let's say, formulate a voice of, of the so-called development countries. Uh, and so when, when uh, uh, Zambia uh, aimed at rebuilding its city center after decolonization, it looked for uh, Yugoslavian architects uh, to invite them to come to Zambia and to, to come to Lusaka and build some of the like iconic uh, buildings along the main street, the main road uh, in the capital uh, and amongst these, this, this Vendeco house. Um, in Zambia, let's stay in Zambia, uh, we also see this beautiful national assembly, the government of Zambia, where the, the parliamentarians sit uh, on eye level with uh, a lion and a tiger. Uh, uh, it's a really fantastic uh, building. Um, but we also come across uh, this Anglican church. Um, and maybe just to dwell a, a few minutes on this, uh, it was built in 1962 uh, by British architects. Um, 1962 is just a year and a half before um, Zambia became independent. And you might, might ask yourself um, why, when it was in a way already clear that, um, that Zambia would gain independence, why did uh, England, after all, it's an Anglican cathedral, uh, why did England... Uh, spend so much effort, money, uh, and time to build uh, to build a, a church um, when it was already clear that, that uh, uh, Zambia would become independent. Um, and I don't have a clear answer to this question, but I can only presume, uh, or we can make a hypothesis on, on, on potential answers. Is it maybe a last futile attempt to convince the local population not to become independent, kind of look at what will, what services and what kind of quality of, of life will provide you with uh, if you would stay under the, um, uh, under the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, government of, of, of Great Britain, uh, or is it a, a kind of a farewell gift, uh, so to say, to to show to the local population or, or a kind of thankful note uh, of, of uh, farewell uh, that you give as a last gift uh, when you leave the home? Um, or is it a, a kind of a Trojan horse uh, to try to instill and make permanent uh, 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 like a a little bit of a, a British culture, you know, after all, Anglican Cathedral, uh, to remain in Zambia uh, even after Zambia has gained independence. Uh, I don't know. I don't know an answer, but maybe it's a combination of all three of these answers. But again, it just shows that behind every kind of architectural product, nothing is innocent. Uh, everything has a, a kind of added dimension. Everything has a political dimension. Um, uh, everything is is uh, kind of uh, um, is is uh, become more more complex uh, through this political dimension. Maybe more quickly, um, I'll, I'll guide you through one of uh, a fantastic 
uh, project uh, in in Abidjan, the, the capital of of the, the Ivory Coast. It's a it's a hotel. Uh, it's the Hotel Ivoire. Um, it's uh, I'll skip over these images. Uh, it's it's the Hotel Ivoire, which really becomes iconic. Uh, uh, it was built in the 1960s. Uh, becomes an iconic place and a very very important place. Uh, for the uh, for Abidjan, which was then uh, the the capital of the Ivory Coast, uh, it was Felix Houphouët Boigny, the first president of of the Ivory Coast, who thought, uh, okay, uh, with independence, uh, we want to provide the most luxurious hotel of the African continent to seduce uh, uh, a global elite to come to uh, Abidjan uh, and and invest in this country, and he. He commissioned an Israeli architect and an Israeli investor uh, to design and build this, this hotel. And we can see from the sketches of this architect uh, slash investor, the kind of the joy uh, maybe that he had uh, designing this, this building of, I don't know, projecting all kinds of probably, I don't know, ideas of what is Africa uh, onto, in this case, the conference hall, um, and then uh, uh, really building this this uh, this hotel complex, resort complex, uh, just outside of the city center, that becomes a, uh, uh, almost like a world in its own, uh, with the biggest um, the biggest pool of the continent, swimming pool of the continent, and so on. But Felix Houphouët Boigny had had uh, much bigger aspirations, and he said, um, if uh, um, France has its Riviera. Uh, Abidjan also needs to have its Riviera. Uh, we want to bring the world to Abidjan. Uh, and he commissioned um, the architect to, to develop a master plan for what he called the African Riviera. And it starts um, with a beautiful map where he puts Abidjan into the center of the world. It is not, uh, I don't know, New York, Paris, or Moscow that are the centers of the world. No, now it is Abidjan. Uh, which again is a beautiful kind of idea or sentiment. Uh, and then, so here on the left, uh, we have the historic center of Abidjan. Uh, he develops a master plan um, for a vast new town extension um, that uh, is supposed to contain maybe a million inhabitants and that are uh, kind of, that is planned according to the newest ideas of urban urbanism with fancy uh, local transport modes, um, very experimental uh, with uh, uh, housing estates, uh, uh, hierarchical uh, kind of structure of these uh, housing estates, all looking super modern uh, on eye level with anything else that is built uh, globally. Uh, we see here the kind of sub centers of this new, new uh, town extension. Mm. But also here, nothing is innocent. Um, uh, what in fact, this, 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 this piece of land, this plot of land, uh, um, looking uh, kind of newly developed, of course, was not uh, empty. Uh, it was inhabited. Uh, it was inhabited by a local population uh, of Ivoirians uh, living in huts like these. Uh, these are in fact photos of that time, of that area. Um, and what the master plan kind of implied was that uh, these um, these local villages that you see marked here in the plan uh, would be quote unquote integrated uh, into the new uh, kind of housing estates, um, uh, and that would become uh, kind of uh, part and parcel of these new housing estates. Uh, what was not spelled out was the fact that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, these people were to be forcibly displaced uh, from their from their villages, and that, that the villages would just be erased uh, and and uh, eradicated, and would be uh, kind of uh, uh, just built over. Uh, so it was uh, just as much as it was the courageous feet of modernization, it was also coupled and combined with uh, um, with uh, um, events of uh, forced migration or forced displacement of a local population that was 
also initiated by the president of Ivory Coast uh, himself. The master plan was uh, uh, kind of ended with a kind of amusement park where if everything is gets modernized, uh, we still want to be African where kind of Af quote unquote African culture is, is celebrated, is performed as a performance staged. Um, but um, the master plan was never executed. It was never implemented. It was never implemented because uh, in 1973, um, with the so-called Yom Kippur War, um, Israel fell out of favor with uh, most African countries. Developments were cut. Uh, Israel was thrown out of the Ivory Coast, uh, and and um, uh, yeah, implementation stalled. Um, what was implemented was the hotel itself, uh, which kept on being a center of, of um, uh, cultural life, political life uh, in the in the city of the country. Many many conferences took place in the conference hall. Uh, we see how it went from a, let's say, exoticized place to a tourism destination to a business center in the 1990s. But then when uh, the Ivory Coast uh, fell into political uh, instability, it also became a center of urban, urban warfare. Um, uh, it became a center of many militias that took over the hotel, also French UN soldiers that occupied the hotel. Um, many uh, there was a mass shooting uh, in the early 2000s uh, of French soldiers shooting Ivarians from the using the the tower as a kind of sniper position. Um, so what we can say in a way is that um, the 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 hotel becomes uh, one means of telling the story of the country. Uh, it becomes a mirror maybe of how the country develops, the aspirations, the failures, the political instability can all be traced by telling the story. Uh, and this, in a way, is what I find so fascinating, that we can unravel and uncover the complexity of this process that we call decolonization by looking at architecture. Architecture can tell the, and unfold the full complexity and 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 uh, complications and in a way uh, the the uh, also uh, disparities of of decolonization when we tell the story of 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 the buildings uh, in more detail and this we try to do in the book um, and with this I'll come also to the last part of the presentation. Uh, uh, the book is structured according to nations, uh, according to countries. Uh, so we looked at five countries, Ghana, Senegal, <clears throat> the Ivory Coast, uh, Kenya, uh, and Zambia. Um, we start with a short history of each uh, country. Um, uh, we start with a, a photo essay. Um, most of the, the photography was done by two, two photographers, Alexia Webster, uh, who photographed uh, Ghana uh, with us, and Ivan Ban, who photographed uh, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Zambia, and uh, Senegal with us. Um, uh, so a, a kind of a photographic essay to really bring you into these cities and nations to make you almost kind of smell the smells and touch the the touch of 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 what these cities look like feel like smell like and then a very thorough documentation of these buildings um again also with very high uh, close up uh, so that we can almost sense uh, also the intensity sometimes the layout of the page mirrors the intensity of the spaces inside of these buildings like here um uh, or like here, where this this marketplace in Kenya that uh, is almost like a, I don't know labyrinthian uh, maze of of stuff being sold and bought. Uh, incredibly intense, uh, fantastic building. We have uh, a, a series of of essays that contextualize the buildings, that critically assess the architectural production, both in this case here of, an, of a, the work of a single architect or, uh, for example, here, fantastic essay by Tzvi Efrat 
uh, on the role of Israel and Israeli architecture within the, the decolonization process uh, on the African continent or uh, stepping outside of the African continent uh, as the last essay, a story of the um, Expo Pavilion uh, uh, called Africa Place, where for the first time, young African nations celebrated their independence at Expo uh, 67. Um, and um, in the end, kind of wrapping up, uh, and, and with this image, I would also like to close, um, uh, yeah, showing the full complexity that underlies the beautiful uh, architectural production uh, on this continent. Maybe as a last sentence, I want to announce that we are working on a follow-up volume, um, African Modernism Volume 2, uh, where we'll, we'll look at uh, a series of, of uh, other countries, amongst them Nigeria, Uganda, and Tanzania, uh, indicating that uh, the story doesn't stop at these five countries that we've looked at Volume 1, um, uh, showing a whole new series of architectural production, but then we'll stop. Uh, with volume two, we'll stop. Uh, and we want to kind of hand it over also to other researchers, architects, and scholars who should pick up uh, these, these stories and develop them further, also maybe critique our standpoint and, and uh, unravel all the many stories that still need to be unraveled. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>